All right, good morning, everyone. It is a beautiful day, right? Yeah, we've got good reason to worship the Lord this morning. Awesome, let's pray. Father, we come before you, and we want to come with humility, and we want to see you high and lifted up like you are. You are our refuge, you're our strong tower, you're who we find shelter under your wings, God. We run to you to find rest and peace. So as we worship you this morning, Lord, we pray for energy, we pray for life, we pray for peace and joy overflowing, because we have reason, we have hope. No matter what's going on, we always have reason to worship you. We can look back and think of the great things that you've done for us, your death on the cross, your victory over the grave, our freedom from sin, and our hope of heaven. A hope that as all this passes away, we have heaven to look forward to with you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.
we cast all our cares, all our anxieties upon you, because you care for us. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Your soul will find rest.
Now I'm on. What? Yep. I'm going to try and sit this time today so I don't, uh, you know, wobble around a little bit. What's that? Thank you, Kelly. What would I do without you? So how are you guys today? Good. Today is going to be uh, a little bit of a nice day, I think. We went to 9 o'clock instead of 8 o'clock because it's staying cooler longer. And, you know, eventually we'll be doing this back on somewhat of a normal schedule. I'm looking forward to that. I don't know about you guys. I'm looking forward to what, maybe not so much what we've always done, but something that where we're all back together and we're going, hey, this is, I like this. I like that we can be together. We can actually hug. We can do all these things and uh, don't have to worry about this, that, or the other thing. But I'm sure that in some ways a lot of this is going to change us for a long time, don't you think? Uh, one thing about it is it's definitely, it's definitely got us all thinking. Uh, if we never thought about hygiene, you probably are now, or at least I hope you are. Um, you know, the, the value of keep making sure you wash your hands and all those things. But it's, it's kind of it's one of those things that, you know, I can't, I can't escape the fact that I think God brought this along or let it, obviously he allowed it because nothing happens without God knowing it. And so I'm just still trying to learn exactly all that he wants. And as a church, we're going to be going and heading into that and trying to figure that out. We uh, have a lot of things coming, coming up throughout the, the winter or the fall and into the winter, and we need to start talking about some things. So Sunday, October 4th, is going to be our quarterly, our quarterly business meeting. Um, at this meeting is where we're going to be talking about the COVID-19 future plans for the church. We're going to get input from everybody. We're, gonna, we're just here, you know, tell you what we have to do, what's happening. Um, by then, we might actually be authorized to even go back inside already, you know, because of the whole... If you try and read the stuff, it's confusing. It's, it's, I don't know, y you, if, you, if you go under these numbers, you're fine, but you have to wait three weeks. And then if you go even one, one over that number, you have to go back under lockdown. And so we want to talk about all that stuff because I'm of the opinion that once we start meeting back inside, I'm not coming back out. Um, and I think that that's something that we sh as a church should talk about. And I think that you guys are, uh, sh I want you to be a part of those discussions. And I want you to know that I pray about this and I pray about you guys, pray about all these decisions daily like probably every second. It's not ever not on my mind. And so trying to make the decisions and do the things that we do, it's always helpful to have some other people knowing what's happening. And so the, the, the board we met on Tuesday and we decided that on October 4th we're going to have this discussion. I do think that it's getting to a time where we might have to say, you know, something's up here, you know, and we need to, we need to do something. Because there, the one I was just watching last night, I was watching a, I don't know what it was, but they were in Florida and they're all back to doing what they always have done. They're out there, on the, they're doing their things, all the, everything's open. Yeah, they're wearing their masks outside, but, and that's just one place. There's so many other states in our country that are doing that. And you have to start wondering at what point is this gonna be, is enough enough? So we're gonna have to see what happens. I guess it's not my choice. So anyway, I, I, said, all this, I said all that just to say that on October 4th, we wanna have a, a nice business meeting to talk about. Not, it's not just about that. It's also our quarterly business meeting where we present our finances and all that kind of, all the regular stuff too. Um, and we'll talk about where we're at as far as, thank you, we'll talk about where we're at as far as the roof, you know, the funds for the roof and all of those things. Um, and in case you didn't know, yes, we still need a roof. And uh, that's not going to fix itself. So anyway, we have all that happening. And then uh, we have plenty of places to serve, and that's something else we're going to start talking about. With COVID-19, with us being outside and, you know, pretty much not doing anything indoors, we have not been doing things a lot lately. You know, we haven't been out doing community events. We haven't been doing anything. So we just need to say, hey, how, how are we going to do this? And so we're going to have other events and other things. So we're going to need some help with some of those things coming up. We'll let you know what they are. But just so you know, let me open this thing up. Thank you. 
Jared uh, and I talked. Jared actually came up with the idea. I'm not going to claim it. This uh, coming up Saturday is a movie night uh, out here in the lot. Be out, he's going to block off the street. And we're going to watch a movie right in the front here. And you know, take your chairs out just like we're doing right now. And we're going to get to watch a movie. We haven't done that in a long time, have we? So kind of something we're going to do like that too. And then we need to start getting back to doing things like that, fellowship together. But also being careful and listening to what people are saying. But anyway... That all being said, there's a, we have children's ministry needs. We have all kinds of different needs. And once we start opening the nursery back up, we're going to really need to get in there and detail and clean that thing. And, and make, you know, all, there's a lot of things going to have to happen. So anyway, when it comes time, we're going to need a lot of help. And uh, part of what we do is serving Christ, right? And that means we serve one another. So there's a lot of things going on down, too, that we need help with, too. And the last thing is um, we're still looking for people to jump onto the, uh, we need some deacons. And we need to talk to somebody about the servant leadership applications, too. If, you, if anybody wants to be on the servant leadership board, they just need to get an application. Just fill it out. It's just basically so you can say you want to do it. Bring it into me, and then I'll, we'll just sit down. We'll just bring it to the office, and we'll sit down, and I'll talk, and that's all there is to it. So all of that said, it feels like I've been talking all morning, and I just started. It's been a challenging morning already. I want to remind you that we have a couple ways to give. We have the... the the, the tub over there, whatever that thing is. I always I don't, never call it the right thing. Or you can just drop your finances in right there if you want to. Or you can give it online. Online is a safe, it's a safe way to do it too. It's fast and it's easy. Um, so you still have those options given to you. You can do it on the, on the website or on our app or text to give. You'll see it there in the bulletin. So with all that said, I'm going to ask God to start us out in prayer. I didn't intend to give all those, all those uh, announcements, but I just felt like it was important this morning because I thought it was behind on a few things. Maybe I might even open my heart up a little bit more this morning about some things that are going on in my life with you. So, um, so Father in heaven, we just thank you for this morning. I just praise you that you would just minister to, to myself and everyone here in this place. God, we need you. No matter what, we're still going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. No matter what, we're still going to tell people that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And so, Father, that, that mission has not changed. And so, Father, thank you for even allowing us to be outside and having an avenue and a way to actually meet together. Lord, we, we thank you for the cooler weather. Thank you for that so much. God, thank you for the, the it's not such an even really unhealthy quality air day. But, Lord, I want to ask you that you'd be with each person's heart today. I pray that you'd empty them and fill them with what you want today, God. Whatever it is that's come to come out of this message, this message is from you, God. This is something you, you wanted me to say. But it's not me, it's you, God. And so I pray for all those who weren't able to make it today or whoever won't, won't be coming back for a little while or those who are sick or whatever's happening, God, be with each and every one of them. And uh, Lord, there's so many people in our family that we're out of touch with because of this whole thing. Help us to all get back in touch with each other. It's important, God. We need each other. Father, we need each other very, very much. So I pray this in your precious, in your son Jesus, precious and holy and healing name, and everyone says, amen. amen. So if you remember, we're still in Acts. I'm going to probably start skipping through a little bit, but I'm still going to, this one here is something I was wanting to talk about a little bit. It's, it's continuing the end of Acts chapter 9. Uh, last week we talked about Paul. Well, no, he's not Paul yet. He's still Saul. Okay, Saul is um, he's, he, he's, he's the one out persecuting. Everybody remember who Saul is, right? I don't have to reiterate that whole thing. Saul was a guy, out, he was out breathing accusations and, per, and persecuting the church and just wreaking havoc in the church, sending people to their death, to prison, just because they were people of the way. Thought he was doing what God called him to do. So uh, it's one of those things to where we have to, we have to figure out, okay, what's, what's God doing here? But God radically changed Paul. Saul, just forgive me if I say Paul, you know what I'm talking about. God radically changed him, but not, not in his personality and not in how he, his makeup. Like he was still a tenacious guy. He was still a very, very good go-getter. That didn't change. What did change is his mission. What did change is what he was doing and who he was, who he was serving. And so with that, I want to read a, a funny little story here to start out this message because today is called The Power of... Uh, the, the value of a brother and, and friend. So two boys collect a bucket of nuts underneath a great tree inside a cemetery on the outskirts of the town. 
When the bucket was full, they sat down out of sight to divide the spoils. One for you, one for me. One for you, one for me. As the other, as the other watched, the one boy said as the other watched, their bucket was so full that, that some of the nuts had spilled out onto the ro- and rolled toward the fence. And it was dusk, and another boy came riding along the road on his bicycle. And as he passed, he thought he heard voices from inside the cemetery. So he slowed down to investigate, and sure enough, he heard, one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me. The boy with the bike knew just what was happening. His face went ghostly white. He said, oh my, he shuddered, it's Satan and the Lord dividing souls at the cemetery. <laughs> right? So he jumped back on his bike, rode off desperately looking for a friend. Just around the bend, he met an old scowling man who hobbled along with a cane. Come with me quick, said the boy. You won't believe what I've heard. Satan and the Lord are down at the cemetery dividing up souls. The man said, beat it, kid. Can't you see it's hard for me to walk? Well, the boy insisted, though, and the man hobbled to the cemetery. When they arrived at the fence, they heard, one for you, one for me. One for you, one for me. And ready to have a little fun, the old man whispered, boy, you must have been telling the truth. Let's go inside and see, what we, if, see if we can see the devil himself. And the child was horrified, but the man was already taking his first step toward the gate. And then they heard, okay, that's the last of them. That's all. Now let's go get those two nuts by the fence and we'll be done. <laughs> they, st- <laughs> they say the old guy made it back to town in five minutes ahead of the boy. More than likely, he was looking for a good friend. <laughs> Friends are important, aren't they? There's, there's something, that g- they're, g- they're a gift from God. They really are. They can, they can, uh, they can light, brighten the, the worst day. They can, they can take the load off. They can be there for you for all things. Paul needed Saul, in this case, was going to end up needing some friends after what happened with him. You know, some people are just constantly looking for friends, and they're constantly looking for friendship. And at times, we all stand with fear by the cemetery fence, so to speak, you know, when life shakes us to the core. At, the times, uh, at times, the legs don't support and a healthy heart that nearly breaks. At times, we can barely muster a prayer when it comes out. It's a plea for a friend. It's a plea for a friend. More than likely, you already know the story of, and you already know about all the story about what happened with Saul. But it is such a well-known passage. We've talked about it a couple of times already. But I'd like you to try and picture Saul's experience from the vantage point of, lo- vantage point of loneliness. You know, in a matter of three days, Saul became the loneliest, Saul became lonelier than he'd ever been. Think about that. He's blind, led off to, to a city that he doesn't know where he's at. And, and, and he was probably begging, for God, begging God for a friend. And Saul must have been physically spent when he neared Damascus. And he traveled some 120 dusty miles to stop the road, stop the church from growing there. That was literally what his point was, to, to stop the people of the way. To stop it. So, then as it came to view, you know what happened. He was getting ready to go get a good meal, maybe get a nice place to, to rest. But all of a sudden, light shone around him. He lost his eyesight. With one blinding light, all was dark and remained dark. With one deafening statement from heaven, you remember that? He discovered everything that he, he believed to be true was false. Jesus, Jesus wasn't the enemy. Jesus was the Lord. Can you imagine, over not, like, within mere seconds you find that out? Your whole life has been doing this, and then you realize, whoa. And so now, talk about being a lonely person now. Put yourself in his position for a second. You've been doing this for... If you were him, how long? Who knows? But people know who you are. That's Saul. He's the one who's the murderer. He's getting people of the way like us, and he's throwing them in jail. And everybody's afraid of him. And everybody would run from him, wouldn't you think? And they were running from him. That's why he ended up going to Damascus, because people were running. But in the depth of that loneliness, in all of that, in the darkness, Saul must have had ex- must experienced a lot from God. I can't even put myself in what he was thinking. We do know that he was given a vision that somebody named Ananias would come to him. And in the three dark days past, loneliness, grief, and despair probably became Saul's roommates. Now this is a different take on kind of something with Saul, and it's different for me too, but I just think it's important to reveal the power, the, the, to, to reveal the power of a faithful friend. And that's what we're going to find out through here. 
Saul was about, about to meet, in fact, two best friends that he'd ever had, that he'll ever have. Two people that would come into his life that he would never even have expected. He commanded, first it was Lord, the Lord commanded Ananias to go to Saul, through, though frightened, and Ananias became the first friend Saul found in his new family of faith. And second, Barnabas became Saul's advocate and friend in Jerusalem. If not for Barnabas, Saul might have not even met the frightened apostles. So Saul never got over his friend, never got over the friends he found in Ananias and Barnabas. And they, by becoming the faithful friends, they were about to change the world. They literally were going to change the world. He and Barnabas together were going to be cha world changers. The Bible says that there's a friend that sticks closer to a, closer than a brother. I believe it's from Psalm. I wrote it down somewhere. I thought Psalm eighteen twenty four. I believe it is. Friends are important. I would even say that that people, brothers and sisters in Christ, are more than friends. Does that, would you guys agree with that? A friend is a friend, but, you know, for lack of a better term, that's what I'm calling this, but we all need these things. By looking at these irreplaceable friends, I'm hoping to find, like, five different things, or a few different things, maybe, that we can talk about. And the one thing I wanted to, let me just read through this here so you guys can hear it all again. So open your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. I bet you're like, when's he going to get into the Bible? Weren't you thinking that just now? When's he going to read it? So we read a little bit about Ananias last week, but we're going to read it again. So Saul picked himself up the ground. Sorry, verse, chapter 9, verse 8. And he opened his eyes, and he was blind. And his companions led him by the ground, hand to Damascus, and he remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Verse 10. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him a vision, in a vision calling Ananias. And yes, Lord, he replied, the Lord said, Go over to Straight Street, to the house of Judas. Where you, when you get down there, look for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many, I've heard many people talk about this terrible man, things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he's authorized by the leading priests to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go for Saul. My, f go, for, my Saul, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to the kings, as well as the people of Israel. And I will show him how much you must suffer for his name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul, laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, had sent, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized, and afterward ate some food and regained strength. Now, Paul states, it says here, the next verse is, Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days and immediately began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He indeed is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who caused such de devastation among the followers in Jerusalem, they asked? Didn't he come here to arrest them and put them in chains and leading to, leading to the leading priests? Saul became, Saul's preaching became more and more powerful, and the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that, uh, couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. After a while, some of the Jews plotted to kill him. Isn't that, isn't that something now? Now all of a sudden they want to kill him. Take out the troublemaker. They were watching for him day and night so they could, they could, so they could murder him, kill him. But Saul, told the, but Saul was told about their plight, and so that during the night, some of the other believers lowered him down the lower bas in a basket through an opening in the city wall. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with believers, but they were all afraid of him. No, I can't understand why people would be afraid of him. Can you, Jimmy? I can't understand that. That doesn't make any sense. Anyway, they were all afraid of him. Lowered in a, so they lowered him through a basket. And when he arrived there, at, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Let me get my brain back on there. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. They did not believe that he'd become a believer. Then Barnabas brought, to him, brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul, how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. And he also told him that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus, uh, Jesus in Damascus. So Saul, Saul stayed there with, er, and went all around with, the, with Jerusalem with them preaching boldly in the name of Jesus. He debated with some Greek-speaking Greek Jews, but they tried to murder him. When the believers heard about this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus, his hometown. Dude, you've got to get out of here. Everybody wants to kill you here. You've got to go. And it says the church, 
Then the church had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, I'm sorry, Galilee, and Samaria. And it became stronger as the believers lived in fear of the Lord. Notice it, I like how it leaves that in there, lives in fear of the Lord. And with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. We're going to talk about those two guys a little bit more. So have you, have you already been thinking about, as I'm talking about best friends, have you already been thinking about somebody that's your, a good friend of yours that's there for you th- through thick and thin, that has called you since, I'm not even talking about, like since you were little maybe even, somebody that you've known your entire life, that the one that will always call you, the one that will always try and be there for you if at all possible. You guys think of anybody, put anybody picture in your mind? A lot of us, that is such a precious gift from God to have a friend like that. Um, some, of those, some of those faces, your favorite people, they, they come to mind. Remembering people we found to be with you. Many of them uh, were with you in the routine of life. Uh, maybe you attended class together. Maybe you, went, you worked together. Maybe you were tennis partners. Maybe fishing buddies. If you live long enough, the best friends of your life were also those who found a way to be with you during tough times. How many stories would we have today if we, t- if we told our, of our friends who drove hundreds of miles to be with us? Or who jumped on an airplane to stand at our side at canceled appointments? The details differ, but, you know, it's all kind of the same idea. Friends are there for you. God puts people in your path that are there for you. Imagine if you were in real need and you called their best friend and he or she says, I can't help you. They're showing a rerun of my favorite television show tonight. How would you feel? That's not much of a friend, is it? No. So you know the truth. That's not a friend. A, friend, a faithful friend simply ignores his or her own needs in order to help a friend. Amen? So this first one is here is be there for them. Ananias was there. He went. I know that God called him. I know God commanded him and said, Ananias, I need you to go over here. But Ananias, God does not force anyone. He doesn't grab anybody by the shoulder and throw them. Ananias did willingly. He listened to the Lord. He trusted God that he would be safe. And, he, and by doing that, was going to be there for Saul. But what if God asked you to befriend an enemy? Well, he has. In half a dozen places in Scripture, love your enemies, Jesus says. In Luke, Jesus says, do good to them and to lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. Ananias certainly had a family and a set of family friend, faithful friends. He lived in Damascus but kept up with the, all that was happening, so certainly he knew about this terrible persecutor named Saul coming into town, and we already talked about that. But it's kinda, I kind of look at it this way, and it's almost like Ananias said to the Lord, said the Lord, I have a new friend for you. I'm going to send you down to somebody. I, I, I need to go friends, befriend somebody. You know, before he even fully understood what he was supposed to do, he went down there. Now, I know this doesn't fit the bill completely, but understand, how far would you guys have gone to somebody that you know that just hours before that had been committing your brothers and sisters in Christ in prison? So, but despite his fear, he went, and there was power in a personal visit. Let me say that again. There's power when you're there in person with somebody. Not saying a phone call isn't good. Of course it is. If that's what you, especially right now, COVID, we can't even get into the hospitals to see people right now. They're not even letting pastors into people. They're not even letting family members get next to their families when they're, you know, they're not doing well. But if you can be there and be present, sometimes that's all people need. That's all they need is for you as a friend. I feel like we just need to be there and just be there for them and be with them. Being there is important. And that's exactly what God sent Ananias here for, for uh, he sent him there so Saul could have someone there. Imagine this now. Now, if you notice, he touched him. He, he, he put his hands on him. He didn't have to, but he did. I think God told him to, but he put his hand on him, and that was on purpose. Have you, have you ever, Gary, I think it was you and I talking about the, the importance of human touch this morning, the importance of contact, the importance of hugs, the importance of handshakes, the importance of smiling, the importance of being near one another. Any of you guys understand or realize that that's important? That's probably the most important thing to a lot of human beings. We can't make it without it. It's one of those things that it's, it's just detrimental without. 
So number one, I've talked, the first thing I said to you was you need to be there, but the next one is know the power of a gentle touch. Every culture no, uses touch in greeting, handshake, a bear hug, a kiss on the cheek, kiss on both cheeks. A touch can simply can show sympathy, friendship, trust, and sometimes powerful trust. And so what a great gift Ananias came when he, to see Paul for the first time. Luke records it in 917, Acts 917, and then Ananias went to the house and entered it and placing his hands on Saul. Saul had literally come there bound, bind by the hands of Ananias. Instead, Ananias used those very hands to touch Saul. In other words, he had literally come there to bind Ananias' hands and all people like him. But instead, Ananias came and freed him. They both probably originally anticipated a struggle. <laughs> Maybe, who knows? Who knows what, what, what was expected? Have you ever had to go do something, you knew you had to go do it, and you didn't want to, and you're all, you're, you're all worked up about it, and you're, you're trying to get there? Just imagine. You know what's happening. You know who you're going to see. Oh, man, what are we, what's going to happen now? What's going to be said? What's going to go down? Am I going to get hit? Whatever. Hopefully I'm not going to get hit if you come see me at the church, but you never know. Um, and to, so anyway, but instead of anything negative, Saul received gentle touch extended from the hunter, from the hunted to the hunter. And imagine Saul might have felt like, felt before Ananias li- arrived. He had been eating, had been drinking for three days. He hadn't even had much human touch. All he had was darkness around him. That's it. Nothing. Then men came with him who would have been frightened at the road, could give no explanation for what was going on with Saul. So he was just left alone to sit in the darkness and die of starvation, and they couldn't stop him. He was blind, frightened, depressed, and how a simple solution for Paul's problem. He needed somebody. He needs something. Well, we know what he's about to get. He was about to get, Saul, about to get Ananias and get his sight, and we knew what God was doing. Think of this. Before Saul heard a word from Ananias, a stranger, before he knew the answers to his questions, Saul felt a gentle touch on his shoulder. And he turned towards a voice, his blind eyes, trying to make, take in the face of a man who would touch him so kindly. I don't know about you, but sometimes that's the biggest and most healing thing is someone that just touches you on the shoulder or puts their arms around you. See, a friend doesn't always have to say any something. Sometimes just being there and then that gentle touch, the importance of, of embracing somebody, a brother and sister. Because sometimes we're just hurting so bad that this is the only thing that's going to help us. It's, o- it's what we need. Words don't always fix it. You guys understand that? Does that re- resonate with anybody? I know this is a different kind of message, but... So a faithful friend knows, when to how to, how, knows how to hold someone when he or she is hurting, how to communicate love with touch, even restore confidence with a special grip. A faithful friend understands the power of a hug, isn't embarrassed to hold on to the hug a little longer than necessary, and don't underestimate, underestimate the power of a gentle touch. So we've got these couple of things happening, and then we speak the right words. See, that was the second. I want to ask you, this is a trivia question. What was the second name Saul had in Scripture? Paul. Aha, I knew you'd say that. Wrong. <laughs> Paul is... It's, it's, Kind of joke. Paul is the third name he had in scripture. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul. He heard him call him Brother Saul. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming has sent me so that you may see and be filled with the Holy Spirit. You probably already spotted it. The second name, Saul, he was Brother Saul. Brother Saul. Welcomed in. Those very words, I don't know about you, but that, that had to be reassuring to him too. Saying just the right thing. Brother Saul. One of those words that's just, it's just something that hits you and it hits you right in, the, right, in the, right in the perfect timing. May not be a big deal to us, but you can bet Saul never forgot the day a man called him brother for the first time. I can remember the first time someone called me Brother Bruce. That still sounds weird. Almost sounds like Brother Bear, but, but it's Brother Bruce. Um, anyway. But it was, um, it was interesting at first. But then you see it's just a respect and love and a family thing. See, Saul and Ananias shared the truth with Saul in a very gentle, and ba- and bapt- gentle way and baptized him. The first person who saw Saul after he heard the truth of the Holy Spirit was a God-sent friend. And 
I do believe that Ananias, and, and I'm sure Ananias and, and Saul probably carried a relationship on. We don't hear anything else about Ananias ever after this. This is the only time we hear about him except for when Paul relates his story later on in Scripture about what happened to him, and he mentions his name again. So over the next several days, he taught Saul, he encouraged him, he introduced him to more people who had the same touch, the same kindness, the same love of the Spirit. What a wonderful, powerful power Saul discovered in Damascus. The first form of power he discovered was the power of faithful friends. If it wasn't, and you have to understand, he was relying on this. Put yourself in his position. He's, he is not, doesn't have any friends there. He's the opposite of friends to people there. And so he needed someone there to help him and to guide him and to take him from place to place. So sometimes just saying just the right thing. Sometimes that's important too. And then supporting people is important as well. So all along this thing here, we've, we have some things happening with Paul and Saul, pardon me. And we need to show support to our friends as well, no matter what they're going through. A faithful friend will stay with us no matter what happens. I'm not saying that they can't, if they're not there for every single second, that doesn't make them a bad friend. So, but when Saul left Damascus, he walked to Jerusalem. Let me, let me re rewind here. I re rewind it a little bit. During the first week of Saul's spiritual training, he met Barnabas. This is where we come into the second friend. Saul ended up going back. Uh, remember we talked about Saul got taken out and got taken back to, uh, he went to Jerusalem. Now he's in Jerusalem, and everybody's, what, afraid of him. Nobody, nobody believed him. I'm trying to think of somebody equivalent today that we heard said they got saved, and we're like, yeah, right, whatever. Um, who's somebody that's recent? Kanye West, maybe? I can't think of Somebody like that. I don't know. He's not even that bad. You can't go and look at him like a murderer or whatever. I remember when I heard, does anybody know who Jeffrey Dahmer was? Mass murderer? He's horrible. I remember when he was put in prison, when he got caught, they said he came to Jesus in prison. And I remember thinking, yeah, no way. There's absolutely no way that monster. There's no way. It's kind of the same thing when you're looking at Paul and Saul here. There's no way that he could, people would look at him and go, there's no way this guy received Jesus. That's why he had to send somebody called Barnabas, to be the, which his, name, his very name means son of encouragement, to come by, come by his side. It's incredible. It's, it's one of those things that we needed, that he needed. And so he had no idea where God was going to put him next, next to the one man that he already nicknamed the encourager. When, ba when Saul left Damascus, he walked to Jerusalem, and apparently leaning, learning all he could from the Christians who walked with him. The conversations must have been intense as Saul learned all, about he, could, all he could about Jesus. And he would come to Capernaum as he returned to Jerusalem, and Saul would have, would have seen for the first time the house where Jesus had lived. In Capernaum, he would have met men and women who had healed, been healed by Jesus. He would have seen the light in their eyes and told the stories of what happened in the Sea of Galilee. Paul is on the way back, and he's going, going over there, and he's heading back, home, heading back to Jerusalem. And as, as he gets closer, can you imagine, I don't know, maybe it's two things, excitement and trepidation at the same time. You know, how am I going to react? How are going to people, two things, how are the Jewish, how are the Jews going to react to me? And how are the people of the way going to react to me? When he arrived, he couldn't find a single disciple. Gee, I wonder. And every time he got close to tracking someone down, yeah, they, they, weren't, they didn't want anything to do with him. So he couldn't get any help. And without help, without a friend, he wouldn't have been able to do anything. And then a, then a, then a solid guy came alongside him in, in, in Barnabas. Acts 9.26 said they were terrified of him. Barnabas, Barnabas took him to, and brought him to the apostles and told him how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and spoken to him, and how in Damascus, how he preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with him and moved about freely about there. What a beautiful example Barnabas is and was, as it is then and today. A faithful friend stands up for you, doesn't waver in support. If you found such a friend, you have found a great source of power. If you are that friend, God's work power is working through you. A faithful friend will stay with you. Bar and I want you to know something. Barnabas' friendship here wasn't short-term. Barnabas ended up going with, with as we're going to see much later in the, in, in the book of Acts, ended up going on missionary journeys with Paul. He would become Paul later. Ended up being his right-hand man, so to speak, for a while. 
went out and evangelized with Paul and, and started churches all over the world, the known world at the time. He retreated, uh, and so he was there for the long haul for Paul. So after all of this happened, Paul ended up leaving. I guess you're probably wondering what happened to Paul. He, went, he went back to, to, ended up going back to Tarsus. His life was threatened a couple times. He went back and did some, some deep, I, I guess you could say some, some spiritual reflection, prayer and reflection. He was there for about three years. And, and this time the church wondered uh, what might have happened to him. Barnabas went to Saul, went to Tarsus to look for Saul and found him and brought him to Antioch. And so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. I don't know about you, but I, can, I, I know that I've had some great friends of mine, pastor friends, Christian friends, who have stood up for me and, and vouched for me when, I've been, when I was either, you know, misrepresented or whatever, or whatever the case may be. God always became my defense. In this case, Paul needed somebody that was credible. And what, what, there wasn't any better person than Barnabas. I don't know about you, but I hope that I'm a friend like Barnabas was to Saul. I try to be. Anyway, they stayed together, and beyond that year, Saul, Barnabas stayed with Saul for a lifetime. They started churches together. They grew missionaries. They were missionaries together. They stayed even together in the midst of disagreements. Yes, they have disagreements later too, but that doesn't mean you're not friends. So in short, Barnabas was the kind of friend Saul needed for, and so, for Saul needed a man to stay with him. Every time we find ourselves in a difficult position, oh, knock that down, that's right. Every time we, we find ourselves in a difficult position, God, if we cry out, God will send some help. God has always given me good friends. I've got a couple right now that I won't name off, but people that I, know I could go to for anything right now. I don't know about you. You have that? That's extremely important. To have that person that you could go to no matter what's happening. So it's important that we know those things. It's important that we, that we could be that friend to somebody. Think about it this way. Barnabas, Paul, Barnabas helped, Ananias and Barnabas helped change the world. Saul, who became known as Paul, eventually would become the most important missionary in Christian history, a leader, a leader equal to that of Peter and John in the church, in the early church. Wrote most of the New Testament. This very man, and if it wasn't for these two men that started out, that God gave him his friendship in the beginning, how many millions of people might not have become Christians? Now, obviously, we know God is sovereign and can do anything he wants to do, but he used these people, and he might be using us to be friends to people around us. Maybe friends that are, that are around us that aren't exactly people that you would want to be around. I don't know if you'd necessarily call them en enemies. I don't call my neighbors enemies. I've got some neighbors that like to play music really loud at night on Saturday night before I have to get up for church in the next morning. But they're not my enemy. Eventually, I'm starting to like that mariachi music. <laughs> I dream with it now. But if God wants me to go over and see them, I need to go over and see them and be their friend. You have to be their friend first. I'm big on friendship, and I'm big on being a friend to people and evangelism. Getting to know somebody so you can tell them about your, and so they can get to know you and tell them about your faith in Jesus. All of this has started happening and all this went down for Paul because he started out on a path that he thought he was serving God and he wasn't. Well, he was. God changed his course. And then now this all went down. The one thing I forgot to mention before I even began all this is did you notice that as soon as Paul received Jesus, as soon as he received his sight, was baptized, what did, what's the first thing he started doing? Preaching the word of God, preaching Jesus, telling everybody about Jesus. That's the one thing I want to encourage you. If you're brand new in your faith or if you've been in your faith for a long time, there's no rec rec requirement to, to, to start preaching Jesus. You're supposed to start it right away. Our mission is always the same. There's anxious hearts out there right now, and they can all be calmed by the peace that passes all understanding or the knowledge that God can work in every situation. So I want to give you guys a couple of minutes this morning to talk about some things. Um, just, what time is it? 9.54. About, how about three minutes? Is that okay? All right, five minutes. And then uh, we'll wrap it up, and then Courtney's going to, then we'll get ready for this afternoon, or this morning, for your next thing. 
So you got to, it's 9.55. You got about five minutes to talk it out and then uh, go from there.
Okay. Sound like you guys were having some good discussions back there, I hope. In case you hadn't figured out, today is what they call a topical lesson. Built off of a passage from the scripture there that kind of had a meaningful pur purpose to us. But to me, I thought it was important that we understand about friends. So the thing is, Paul didn't just impact Barnabas and, and uh, Barnabas and Ananias didn't just help Paul. Think about it. They helped a lot of us too. Today, nowadays, we all have gotten the opportunity to hear from Saul, and he's and, and his writings has changed our life, at least mine. So Paul wrote them, dynamic, confident, and irrepressible. He's a crucial leader. Being a friend is probably one of the toughest things to do because we tend to let people down sometimes. We don't mean to. We're human beings. We're not perfect. That's not, this isn't an idea of perfection. But just try. Just doing is what we need to do. Just be there. And uh, a friend that sticks closer than, as a, than a brother. So uh, can I, I'm going to close this out in prayer. I hope you guys have a, an outstanding day. We'll let you know as things are going on. I'm going to try and keep communicating with you. The problem is I don't know what's changing from day to day with this whole coronavirus stuff with the regulations. That's why we're just like, if we say this, how does this work? And say this, and how does this work? And then, so things are changing. So we're figuring that out as we go, too. Got some, uh, got some things happening. So be praying for the church, for us all about that, too. And uh, got a few people going to be leaving us here soon. I don't know if I'm allowed to say who it is yet. I'll let them talk about it when they're ready. You know, they're going to be moving. Not me. But... Um, all right, well, let's pray. So, Lord, we just thank you for this, this day, and I pray that Lord, today was a different kind of more message. Today was more about relationships. Today was more about being there for others. Today was more about just being a friend. And I think, God, there's probably been so many people in my life that I can look to that have done that for me. But if I'm being honest, there's only been a handful that have been really tight like that that I can still count on today. But God, you bring those people into our lives. These aren't just acquaintances. These are people that you bring into our lives. So Father, I'm praying for everyone here. I'm praying that if anyone's going through anything, that they would, they would have that friend that would be able to come to them. I pray, God, that you would send them the right person at the right time and give them the right comfort that they need, whatever it may be. And God, I pray for church service uh, right after this. I pray for the, uh, the kids' service coming up. I pray that you would bless it. I pray that the kids would learn, the families would learn a lot from it together, and they would take the tools that they get there and bring it home with them and continue the lesson on in. God, we trust you. I pray that we would do the same with our, with our time with you, God. I pray that we would take this from today and work it into our Monday all the way till next Sunday again and keep going. God, we need you with everything that we do and say. Be with our country right now. Be with all of our firefighters, our first responders. Be with our president, all our le elected leaders, our governor, and everybody else. We need you, God. In Jesus' precious name we pray, and we all say, have an outstanding morning, you guys. <laughs>